I'm Bill Moyers. It's one of the oldest debates in philosophy. Do we do what we do because we choose to or because we have to? Is our will free or are we prisoners of destiny? That uh, academic debate has taken on a certain practical urgency. Doctors, the courts, the police, the public all wonder, well, what about behavior that's addictive or destructive or criminal? How much control do we have over that? And the answers just may lie not in philosophy, but physiology. Not in the mind, but the brain. We'll talk about the difference with Patricia Churchland. A World of Ideas with Bill Moyers. Funding for this program is provided by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, a catalyst for change. Corporate underwriting is provided by General Motors and its Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, Cadillac, GMC truck divisions, and GMAC. General Motors, committed to excellence. Congress has declared the 1990s to be the decade of the brain for the purpose of highlighting the importance of research into what has been called our wonder tissue. Patricia Smith Churchland, professor of philosophy at the University of California in San Diego, is on the new frontier of exploration into how the brain works. In her book, Neurophilosophy, she writes about how recent discoveries call into question some of our basic philosophical concepts, such as free will and rational thinking. I talked with Dr. Churchland at her home near San Diego. What's a, a philosopher doing studying the, the science of the brain? I mean, it seems to me that's, that's more naturally uh, the domain of the, of the trained scientist, not a philosopher. Well, in a way, that's true, except that suppose, as it seems, that how we perceive and think and reason is all, in fact, brought about by the brain, that those are our processes in the brain then if we really want to understand who we are, what kind of things we are, and what it is to think and to see, then we need to understand those processes in the brain. What got you on to this path? It was that I got very dissatisfied with much philosophy and indeed with much psychology when I was a graduate student because it seemed to me that it really did ignore the brain and didn't just say, well, the brain isn't interesting, but it said... Uh, rather, it didn't just say, well, I'm too busy to pay attention to the brain. It said, the brain doesn't matter. How the brain does these things isn't actually very interesting because we want to understand the nature of cognition or the nature of language or vision at a different level. And it's at the level that's analogous to a program in a computer. And just as you wouldn't want to care too much about the inner workings of the chips of a computer, but you would want to care about the program. So they said, why bother uh, caring very much about the nature of the brain? And I guess I was just stubborn enough to think that that was wrong. Have you ever held a brain or looked at a Yes, I have, actually, several of them. Um, when I initially decided that I wanted to understand more neuroscience, part of the motivation was this. I couldn't tell from looking at a two-dimensional picture where things were because you could see it on one page, but on the next page it would look different. So I phoned someone at the University of Manitoba in the anatomy department, and I said, look, I'm really having trouble knowing where things are in the brain. And he said, the only way to do it is to take anatomy. So I went to the medical school along with the medical students and took all of the regular neuroscience, neuroanatomy courses. And one of them was a lab. And um, we did cells, of course, first. And then one day they wheeled in a big trolley, and on the trolley were Tupperware pots, each of which contained a human brain for each of us. And what we needed to do then, of course, was to dissect the brain so we could understand how it worked the gross parts at least were put together. When you dissected that brain, did you think, I'm looking at a mind? Well, I 
did in a funny sort of a way. I mean, when I first took out the, the brain out of the pot, I, I was tremendously moved. I mean, this was a human brain that I held in my hands. It was somebody's, and somebody who had been alive and been a person and been somebody's mother, and, uh, and it was a very moving thing. And, but, of course, what I always wanted was to know, but how does it work? Sometimes I... Uh... I lay awake at night and my, my thoughts are like monkeys in trees or, or shooting stars or, or fireworks someone else set off. I haven't summoned them. I don't want them there. Yeah, I, in fact, I yeah. banish them. I, I try sure, to banish them, but sure. they come back. They're, they're, they're not related. There's, I thought about this. I thought about that. I have no control over what's going on up mm, there. Mm. What's happening as far as you know in your study of the mind? I think we have an illusion of how much control we have over our thoughts and perhaps even over our decisions and choices and so forth. Um, but I suppose the fast answer to your question is we really don't know where, where these things come from. I mean, we have a bit of an idea about dreaming now, but we really don't know about where those sorts of thoughts come from. You see, the traditional view that I grew up with is that if the brain doesn't work logically, the, there must be something wrong with it. Right. Now, are you challenging that notion? Well, it doesn't look like the brain, uh, at least at the level of circuits, it doesn't look like the brain is a logic machine. It doesn't look like the brain, in fact, is a computer of the kind that we're used to having on our desktops. It looks like it's a very different kind of beast altogether. And that when we go through a series of reasoning, it may be underpinned by sort of uh, a mulch of activity on the part of neurons that looks nothing uh, like logic. I suspect it won't look anything like logic. So it may also turn out to be the case that, that some of what we think of as reasoning involves only a very little bit of logic, that there's some here and there's some here and there's some here, and in between, there's a whole lot of reasoning and processing, but we really, it's not really describable in terms of the logic that we're familiar with at all. It's sort of mulch, 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 uh, whatever, you know, whatever that turns out to be. Well, I guess what I'm getting at is that our notion of individual responsibility centers on, on an individual making rational decisions. And what you're suggesting is the possibility we may not be making rational decisions. We may be responding to activities and behaviors of these neural cells that, that we don't control. We obviously don't control them. One way to think about it, I think, is that what we count as rational is maybe very different from what we thought. That is, we might have thought that in order to be rational, you had to go through a series of steps of conventional logic. And it might turn out that as a theory about what it is to make a rational decision, that's just not very good. And that, in fact, it looks very different. So if it turns out that we can explain the difference between somebody's being, making a rational choice and, and they're not in terms of the behavior of neurons, that isn't going to change anything. You're still going to be a rational person, even though it's your neurons that are doing it. Because <laughs> they've always been doing it and you've always been rational. And um, so I think we will achieve a deeper understanding of what it is to, to make a choice and, and to make a rational choice. But it may also help us to understand, too, those circumstances where, as we now say, people do not make a rational choice, uh, where a woman stays with a husband who batters her, for example, and so on. Um, if we understood more about the way the brain worked, we might be able to understand a little better what happens in those sorts of circumstances. Will it help us to teach our children mm -hmm. better or differently? Well, I would be surprised if it didn't have implications about uh, implications for learning and implications concerning how, how we can learn more efficiently. For example, it's clearly the case that most types of dyslexia that we know anything about are biological in their basis. They have to do with a miswiring of the brain. Now, if we understood that, 
miswiring, if we knew exactly what it was and could either prevent it or could bring about rewiring or whatever, then it would make a major difference in how children learn to read, or at least in how dyslexics learn to read. And there might be comparable things that we might understand uh, about normal children that would allow us uh, to do better in teaching. What about the um, treatment and prevention of Alzheimer's disease? Is there any possibility or conceivability that, that this could help us down that path? I think so. Um, First, we have to have the knowledge of what exactly is going on, and then we have to address the question of how might we bring about uh, a change, or how might we prevent it. Can it be that uh, there's a key to treating addiction in this? I think that that is a real possibility, that we may both understand the nature of addiction, find out ways to prevent it, and possibly to cure it. And possibly other compulsions as well? And possibly other compulsions, yes. Because I, I, I know that the compulsions I feel occasionally, I don't know the source. They don't seem to be intellectual or, uh, yeah. or, ev or, or even philosophical. They just seem to be something inside driving mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. appetite mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. whatever it is, mm -hmm. whether it's work sure. or, or, or whatever. Yeah. Well, in fact, obsessive compulsive behavior, real compulsive behavior, you know, hand washing 99 times a day and so on, uh, has been shown to have a biological basis. Now, probably the compulsions that you would have, you know, thinking a certain thought or not being able not to work and so forth, uh, those may be different, but they may be related. And so the possibility of understanding that kind of thing is, I think, very much alive. So would this help to explain, if we knew this, uh, common sense, the tool that we use every day just to get through <laughs> the world without even thinking about it? Well, I mean, look, ideally, of course, we have to be able to explain all of these things. We have to be able to explain... Well, we get along without explaining them. I mean, we do them. I reach out oh, and touch sure. your hand. Yeah. I, or I throw the ball. Or I, questions come without my composing sentences. Sure. Well, why would one want to know, yeah. you might ask. Why would one want to know? And there are a number of reasons. Let's take the simplest reason first, and the simplest one would, would be the biomedical one, and that is that uh, there are many kinds of diseases, some we call psychiatric and some we call neurological, that humans have, where we really desperately need to help people. And so we need to be able to understand the brain in order to do that. That I understand. So that's right. That's the biomedical issue. And then I suppose there is what one might call the scientific issue of just wanting to know, just wanting to understand. And it shouldn't be thought, of course, that that's just a kind of romantic ideal without practical implications. Because notoriously in the history of science, uh, when people have tried to understand something just because they wanted to understand it, they stumbled upon something that had incredible practical results that they would never have got if they had gone for the practical mm -hmm. results first. I mean, if you had said to Marie Curie, now, my dear, what you must do is uh, find me the means for being able to look inside the body so I can tell whether somebody's bones are broken, it would have been hopeless. And as it was, she stumbled upon something that had incredible implications. And I think the same is, is true with regard to understanding the brain. One possible implication, of course, is technological. If we understand what kind of a computer it is that fits in here, then, of course, we will be able to make computing machines that uh, make the current best computers look like sledgehammers. Well, I understand, the, uh, I think I understand the biomedical appeal, the scientific appeal, uh -huh. the technological appeal, but the philosophical <laughs> appeal, why you are pursuing this, is, is still intrigues me. Look, one way to think of it would be that, that the traditional questions that philosophers have wanted to answer from Plato on have had to do with the nature of knowledge and the nature of consciousness. And I'm assuming that if we do understand the brain, we will understand the nature of knowledge, learning, memory, and so on, and uh, that we will understand the nature of consciousness, of how it's possible that you can take 
just a brain. <laughs> just, just a brain. A brain. Uh, and yet it has awareness, and yet it can introspect, and yet it can talk. But what comes to mind is, is are we just the activity of molecules? Are we just molecules in motion? Is this inquiry leading us to think of ourselves as just primarily, or essentially, or just uh, material? Yes. When I say that the mind is the brain, when I say that vision just is a function of the brain, that's what I mean. That there, are, there is nothing other than the cells and the way they're put together. Now, it's hard to see, in a way, how it is. You look at a cell under a microscope and you say, how could that thing have anything to do with my feeling pain or my seeing a color? Or my falling in love. Yes. Two things, I think, need to be said about that. And first of all, the, the first thing that needs to be said is, of course, it isn't an individual neuron that does it. It isn't an individual neuron that feels pain. It's a whole interactive set of neurons that do. Um, and similarly with falling in love. I mean, it isn't that there's one little neuron out there in the parietal cortex that says, oh, you know, uh, you know this is the real thing. It, it, obviously, it can't be like that. So that's part of the answer. The other part of the answer is this, that I think, you know, with regard to understanding the, the neurobiological basis for psychological functions, like falling in love and seeing, we're sort of a bit like where Aristotle was with respect to understanding the nature of motion. And we've got a long, long way to go. And just as for Aristotle, for example, it would be impossible to imagine uh, a space that wasn't Euclidean, a space that had a shape and that was deformed by large gravitational masses. So we might say, God, it's impossible to imagine how you know, the redness of an apple, the seeing of the redness of an apple, could be caused by or could be identical with the behavior of a set of neurons. But the important thing is this. We mustn't let our own failures of imagination tell us what must be the case in the universe. One of the things I must say that has impressed me rather a lot um, was this. A number of months ago, um, I, amongst a few other neuroscientists, was asked to give a tutorial on the brain to the Dalai Lama. And the explanation was that he was simply very interested, that he wanted to know about the kinds of things that we were working on, and he wanted to understand in order to you know, think about things more wisely. And so we had uh, had a meeting in, in Newport Beach. Now, the thing that I thought was profoundly interesting about the Dalai Lama was this. He had no dogma. He was willing to change his mind about anything depending on the nature of the evidence. And on certain occasions, he did. Um, and that he seemed to take as the most important aspect of his religious, um, of, 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 of the religion of Buddhism, to have to do with questions of how to live a life. And there he talked about compassion, and he talked about honesty, and so forth. But he didn't advert to any dogmas about the nature of the universe, about whether the earth is in, is, is in the center of the solar system, or about whether species were created, or whether there was a mind independent of the body, and so on. He said, if those are the facts, those are the facts. What did you think when you came away from, from this well, session with him? What I thought was important was that on issues of science, of issues of the nature of the universe, he wanted information from the people who knew or the people who had the most information available. And he was not going to insist that the universe be one way because the Buddhists had thought that for the last 2,000 years. So it seemed to me this kind of separation of matters of fact on the one hand and matters of morals on the other hand was really quite important. And it would not relieve us from 
the necessity of constructing ethical ways of dealing with one another. Absolutely not. Yeah. I mean, I think that's all very much open. And uh, I don't think that discovering things about the way the brain works is going to tell us what sort of moral system is, is most appropriate. Now, it might tell us some things that bear upon that. In other words, it might give us facts about that that would be relevant. Such as? Um, well, about the kinds of flexibility people do and don't have in molding their character or the kinds of, or, or in making difficult decisions in, as it were, weakness of will. The limits of free will. Yeah. I think it might be very helpful with regard to those kinds of things. But, but we would still have to reason together and make a decision about what to do with that knowledge. What does this do to the religious philosophers who write about God breathing into the clay the spirit of mm -hmm. life, the soul of, 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 of life, to mm -hmm. the religious idea of mm -hmm. the soul? Do you think that's just a metaphor? I don't think it can be accurate. And even talking about goal, God breathing life into something, we now know, of course, that life isn't like that either. Uh, that uh, life also is a function of the organization of matter. See, when people used to be vitalists, and they used to say there is a living force, there is the life force, and if you want to explain the difference between living things like us and dead things uh, like rocks and uh, pieces of concrete, then you had to do it in terms of the life force. Well, now we know that that's just not. That's not on. I mean, ever since Watson and Crick discovered DNA and since molecular biology has proceeded, it's very clear uh, that uh, that's not the correct explanation of living things. What is the correct explanation has to do with the organization of very complex molecules, proteins, and so on. And uh, I think a similar thing is likely to be the case with regard to the mind and the brain. Um, there isn't a special thing, the mind. The mind just is the brain. What is different about your saying that the mind is the brain? Well, although many people have thought for a long time that that's got to be the case, what is new now, I think, is that we're beginning to be able to see how particular aspects of mind are related to particular structures in the brain. How, for example, being able to recognize a face has got, is, is a function that's carried out by a fairly small region of the brain on both sides. Or that color vision seems to be handled mainly by a very small part uh, of visual cortex. So we're, I think, getting more specific now. We used to just say, the mind is the brain. And argued for that in a very general way. Now it's clear that we can say a whole lot more. But we don't know everything we'll be saying, do we? This is really just the first step. But it's a very important first step. And it's very exciting to speculate, because having taken that first step, you want to sort of see what the larger picture might look like and what else you might understand, and how else you might think of these things, when we know a little bit more. And it's more exciting than doing that, perhaps in the case of chemistry, because after all, this is us. You know, we're not talking now about, uh, about some other aspect of the universe. We're talking about how we work, how we are, what makes us the kinds of things that we are. And understanding ourselves from an objective, that is, neurobiological point of view, rather than uh, just from a subjective point of view. And that's very exciting, I think. Do you get up every morning and go to work thinking you're on a new frontier? Well, almost, I guess, because we really are at the point where I think neuroscience is going to make major discoveries uh, that will explain psychological phenomena. And there is a kind of convergence of psychology and computer science and neuroscience right now. And, and they really all need each other, and they've all sort of come together 
in order to try to solve the, the problems of how the brain works above the level of the single cell, above the level, that is to say, of the individual neuron. How the whole system is operating. How the, the whole system universe operates. of the body, in a yes. way. Yes, yeah. And I think it's enormously exciting. And, and there's just remarkable things being discovered almost on a daily basis. It's wonderful. It's absolutely astounding to me that this organ can attempt to understand itself. Indeed. And perhaps what we've done is sort of underestimated the capacity of the brain when we look at it and say, well, you know, that's just three pounds of meat. Uh, it's three extraordinarily glorious, marvelous, almost miraculous pounds of meat such that we can do things like recognize one another. From our home near San Diego, this has been a conversation with Patricia Churchland. I'm Bill Moyers. Funding for this program was provided by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, a catalyst for change. Corporate underwriting was provided by General Motors and its almost 800,000 employees in 38 countries. General Motors is committed to excellence in quality products and television programming.